Hi guys, um, I'm going to be giving you my conservation lecture. I know I can't be there in person, but I'm going to go through this PowerPoint as if I were there. And you can fill in your worksheet as I go along. Finish the worksheet for home uh, for homework if you don't finish it during class. So we're going to talk about primate conservation. We're also going to talk about some public health information um, that goes hand in hand and it basically merges my two research projects together. The important issues I want you to get out of this presentation are what the major issues are that threaten primates and what we can do about this. Um, we also want to think about humans and human behavior and how this influences um, primates and how we can help with conservation. And then also merging public health, especially clean water programs, and how this can help people and conservation globally. There will be two parts. The first part is my chimpanzee conservation research, looking at threats, looking at why primates are endangered and what we can do to help. The second part is the public health part on clean water. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will have some information on ways you can help and you will also have an extra credit option on Blackboard about conservation advocacy. So you can use your handout you got in class, you can use this lecture and any of the resources I say in this lecture to do that assignment. If I were there in person, I would ask to see a show of hands for anyone who has heard of the term bushmeat. I'm guessing though, even though I'm not there, there's only a few people raising their hands. Um, this is really an important um, factor for me. I spent all of my time um, in grad school focusing on this issue. It is a major threat to primates and it's something that will lead to extinction. It's something I'm passionate about and really no one that I know has ever heard of it before. So that's one of my main goals is to just make you guys aware of one of the biggest threats facing primates. Let's do a quick recap of primate classification. This will help you on your quiz and your midterm as well. We know we have the primitive guys, the prosimian strepsirines, and then we have anthropoid haplorines, which are divided into new world monkeys, the platyrines, and old world monkeys, apes, and humans, which are catarines. And therefore, catarines are divided into the monkeys, which are cercopithecoids, and the apes, which are hominoids. And for this presentation, we'll fo focus mainly on hominoids. We'll focus um, in there on a lot of the apes, especially chimpanzees. All right, so why do we study primates? You guys know that they're very important to me, but why else would we study them? Well, we know that they are genetically so similar to us. It helps us understand health. Um, they're our closest living relatives, so we can understand behavior, intelligence, culture. It helps us to understand human evolution, looking at how they're adapting to their environments. And it also helps us in the medical field, and you guys have a homework assignment on the ethics of using primates for the biomedical um, field, and so that's something that will be due next class. <clears throat> All right, I've talked about this a little bit, but I want to go over um, the growth and development of primates. We know that primates don't have litters like other mammals do. They have one to maybe two offspring at a time, and their development is very slow. They have a long uh, period in between births called the interbirth interval, up to 10 years. And this is because they are intelligent creatures and they want to have investment into their offspring. They want to make sure that offspring knows all of the information before it goes off on his own. This also negatively affects conservation efforts. So if we look at this chart, we're looking at a prosimian, a monkey, a small ape, a large ape, and ourselves. You can see as we go from left to right, we are increasing the lifespan and we're increasing the length of time to develop. This is because the more intelligent an animal is, the longer it needs to learn and therefore the longer it spends growing. Before we move on, I do want to um, warn you that there are some pictures that are going to be disturbing, um, but that is the reality of what I'm talking about. I also want to elicit an emotional response from you guys. Um, it is very important that you see the reality, but I also don't want you to get depressed and remember at the end of the presentation, I will give you some ways you can help and you do have extra credit options for helping as well. So what is bushmeat? Bushmeat is really just any wildlife that is hunted and eaten from a forest. For me, I focus mainly on Africa, but it can happen in Asia and South America as well. It's a very important source of protein for people. For some people, it's the only source of protein. 
but it is not sustainable and in some countries it's exceeding 1 million metric tons per year. What you need to know is that bushmeat is the main threat to the great apes. It will cause their extinction. And again, nobody even knows about it. That is my conundrum. That is what drives me to talk about this. We're going to look at bushmeat and then we're also going to look some at some related threats to see how all of these together are really pushing primates to the brink of extinction. This is a visual I want you to keep in mind. Our overall theme, our umbrella term is bushmeat hunting. And then connected, we have logging and palm oil, we have entertainment, and we have the illegal pet trade and the biomedical trade. Here are some examples of bushmeat. We can have some deer-like species, ungulates like gazelle. We can have capybara, which are large rodents. There could be birds, there could be reptiles. Um, we're focusing on the primates, the monkeys and apes, and what's happening is bushmeat is really starting to target endangered species. So the meat is taken to market. It is usually smoked, kind of turned into a, a jerky, I guess, for preservation. They don't have refrigerators. But you can see that the mandrel on the right and the gorilla on the bottom, these are endangered species. And so people are choosing to hunt animals that are already um, going to go extinct. And so this is what we're going to focus on today. Now, why is bushmeat hunting so bad? Hunting is a natural part of life. It has been for millions of years for humans all over the world. I don't have a problem with hunting an animal as long as it is sustainable. Um, but what we're seeing is bushmeat hunting is out of sync with the environment. And this is because of what we mentioned before um, with the development, and this is called life history theory. Again, we have that chart showing the smarter the animal is, the longer it takes to develop and the longer lifespan it has. I want you to think of it this way as quality versus quantity. On the left side of the graph, you have animals that are not, you know, too terribly uh, intelligent. <clears throat> and they're giving birth to lots and lots and lots of babies every year. They are focusing on quantity, right? Look at the rabbit. Tons of litters, lots of babies each litter. And this is because rabbits are only going to live one or two years. They're not particularly bright and they get eaten by a lot of things. On the other end, we have something like a chimpanzee or an orangutan that could take five to ten years for every offspring. And that's focusing on quality. But if you're taking so long for development, it means it could take 10 to 20 years to replace you in the environment, and that is what is causing them to be wiped out so quickly. They can't keep pace replacing the population with how much humans are taking them out. <clears throat> so there's an economic reason for bushmeat hunting being so bad. It is not just about providing food for families. It's not just subsistence. It is now for profit. The main reasons for this are, number one, we're overpopulated. There's way too many humans. There's not enough food resources. Number two, in Africa at least, there's not economic stability. So people don't have options of other jobs or other ways to make money. We're also going to look at supply and demand and energy return rates. We know supply and demand means that the rarer something is, the more valuable it is. So hunters use this idea. They want to target a species that's going to get them a lot of money. They also don't want to put in a ton of energy for not much return. So you don't want to go around spending all your days hunting and find just one rabbit to bring home. That's really not very economically wise. Instead, they target larger species like chimpanzees because if they go out and hunt all day, at least they're going to get a lot of meat um, they're going to get a lot of profit from that large animal. They also target endangered species because they're rare. If you hunt something that's rare, you're going to get a higher price for it because the supply is low. Then you've actually made the supply lower, so that drives the price even higher. And this is just kind of a snowball effect that can really turn into extinction. So does this make bushmeat hunters horrible people? Should we hate them? Of course not. As I said, bushmeat hunting is money, it is food, it is how they keep their families alive. In Africa, I lived among these people. They are not evil. They do not hate the environment. They do not hate animals. They just don't have any other options. Therefore, it's the lack of opportunities 
that is causing these hunters to target endangered, endangered animals. It is causing them to wipe out their forests. So one way to solve the problem is give them other options. So now let's talk about some associated industries that are connected to bushmeat hunting. With logging and mining, um, these are very destructive for the rainforests. Um, logging is wiping out rainforests. That's bad for climate change. It's bad for um, our clean air, our oxygen, and it's also wiping out resources. It also makes forests easier for people to go into and hunt. Uh, loggers a lot of times also hunt while they're on the job in order to feed their families or make extra money. And we find that people are fighting conservation efforts because they don't want their economics taken away from them. So we had in the Democratic Republic of Congo a silverback gorilla and his whole harem killed and not taken for food, not sold for profit, just killed as a warning from the charcoal industry that if conservationists keep meddling, they're going to wipe out all the animals so that conservationists will have nothing else to um, complain about. I'm going to ask you to look at palm oil for your extra credit assignment. Palm oil is a very healthy oil that's used in about 50% of our um, products every day, but it's being harvested unsustainably in Indonesia. The people are wiping out their forests. Um, this is going to lead to the extinction of the orangutan, the gibbon, the elephant, and the tiger, just to name a few in those countries. Um, it's also really bad for the people. Uh, they're wiping out their environment. They are getting horrible pollution, lots of respiratory problems from all of the fires. And once they're done with all these um, palm trees, they're going to go back to not having any way to make money. So we need to fix this by making sure palm oil is sustainable and by telling companies they have to use sustainable palm oil. So you're going to go on Blackboard. You're going to see the instructions, but I want you to use social media and email to contact companies and to tell the public about this and be an advocate. Um, also on your handout on the back, there are a lot of different names palm oil can be called in ingredients lists. So try to look at the ingredients you have at your home and see if you are unknowingly leading to the de destruction of the environment and to the extinction of these animals. The second industry is entertainment. And of course we live in LA, so this is really important for us. If you see a primate in entertainment, it's only a baby because adults are far too strong and too much of a liability. An adult chimpanzee is about 10 times stronger than an adult human. The babies are psychologically abused. They are psychologically damaged from being taken from their mothers. You can also not train primates very well using positive reinforcement. They're very strong. They're very smart. They're very stubborn. So training is usually negative in the form of random abuse like burning, pinching, um, tasing. It's very difficult um, for these primates to develop um, you know, properly psychologically because they're always abused. What I want you to know is the smile that we think we see on primates is not a smile, it is a fear grimace. It is like a dog baring his teeth. That primate is saying, I'm terrified, I'm stressed, and I'm warning you by showing you my teeth. Once the primate becomes too old, which is about five or six years, it's too strong to handle, so it is then sold to medical testing. So these animals are completely exploited by humans. They suffer their whole lives, and it's completely unnecessary. So here we see the smile. You can see it's a very tight face. It is a grimace. It is showing the teeth. This can only be created using fear. On the video Ape Genius, we saw chimpanzees playing in the water. You can see here, that a happy face is a droopy face. The lip is sagging. You can't see the upper teeth. If they were moving around, the lip would be bouncing. So there's a difference between a happy face and what we would mistakenly think of as a smile. So if you see this in films, TVs, ads, commercials, greeting cards, please don't assist this. Please tell people why it is not okay to have primates in entertainment. They don't want to be dressed up. They don't want to be abused. They don't want to be on set and then have to be taken to a biomedical facility when they're too strong. On the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie, Crystal the Capuchin that you see here in The Hangover uh, randomly bit one of the makeup artists. Um, so it's really not a great idea to have a wild animal forced to do things on set with a bunch of lights, noises, and strangers. It's just 
asking for trouble to happen and it's inhumane. So instead, use CGI, right? You don't have liability, faster completion, better results because you're not wondering if the animal is going to do what you want it to do. You get someone like Andy Serkis, who is in Planet of the Apes, amazing actor. You use the computers. It's a wonderful performance. It's all ethical and humane. And we really, really need to be supporting this. Plus, it's 2016, so it's pretty easy to do stuff on computers. The third industry is the pet trade. Now, I know primates are really adorable, and as I've been showing you pictures, especially of babies, everyone thinks that they're so cute. Yes, they're adorable. Yes, they will bond with you, but it is absolutely inhumane to have them as pets. Natural behaviors for primates are climbing, tearing, biting, screaming, throwing things, peeing, pooping, these are not things somebody wants in their house. So after a couple of years, the primates are really hard to control. People have to keep them in cages. Sometimes they have their teeth removed. Sometimes they make them wear shock collars. That's not something you should be doing to a pet or a part of your family. And then if that animal attacks, it has to be put down. If the animal becomes too wild, you have to find some place for it to go. And there's not really any options that they can go to have a happy, normal life. Here we have a baby spider monkey, and even as, as an infant, it can cause a lot of damage, even with its baby teeth. The next picture is very graphic. It shows a woman who had visited her friend's male chimp many times, but this one time the chimp attacked her. And really what happened is the male chimp wanted a companion. He wanted a mate, and he tried to um, do this with a woman, and she refused him. And in chimp society, that doesn't happen. It causes violence. And so he attacked her. He had to be put down. They found out that he had been on very high levels of Valium because his owner was unable to um, be around him safely. And this woman now has, goes around to talk about why exotic pets should not exist. She lost her entire face. She lost both of her hands. Her life has been ruined. She um, has no eyes. She was the recipient of a face transplant but she will never have a regular life, and this definitely could have been avoided. The last industry is the biomedical field, and you guys have an assignment on this. Um, a lot of the primates who were in the medical testing facilities decades ago were brought in from the wild. Now they breed them in the facility. Um, I have seen cages where monkeys are kept 20 to a cage, and they're treated like living test tubes. Apes are only required to be in cages that are 5 feet by 5 feet by 7 feet. That's the size of a small closet. Um, you know how intelligent and emotional these creatures are. So to have them in these cages, to be kept alone when they're social animals, to not give them toys, that's inhumane in and of itself. But then they're experimented on with diseases like hepatitis, tuberculosis, HIV. They have surgical procedures. They have organ removal, bone re removal, um, implants put in, prosthetics put in. Just in good science, you can't really tell what is actually causing the result because they are tested with so many different things. And while chimps are almost 99% identical to us, that 1% is very different. An example is HIV. HIV came out of SIV, the simian a form of the virus millions of years ago. So all the chimps alive today are the descendants of chimps who survived SIV. They don't get HIV. They don't get AIDS. Even when we're giving them 10,000 times um, an infective dose every day for years, there's only ever been one chimp who got HIV and he didn't die from it. So why were we spending billions of dollars every year to infect chimps with HIV to try to find a vaccine when they don't get sick from it? This is ridiculous, it's wasting money, and it's not scientifically valid. Plus, you have the ethical consideration of having intelligent beings who can communicate and be emotional locked in a prison and acting as literal lab rats. Good news happened in November 2015. The National Institutes of Health decided to stop biomedical research on chimps. They realized there was no justification and all of the money they had spent didn't really bring about any results. This is great news, although now we have to find a place for all of these retired chimps and that's very expensive. Um, and many other primates, including monkeys, are still being used and will continue to be used. So we need to 
still look at alternatives, and that's what I'm asking you to do on your assignment. So let's talk about part two. Why is bushmeat not being stopped? Well, number one, the reason is nobody knows about it. So that's part of my job and that's part of your job is to spread this awareness. Also, a lot of research just focused on the animals. When I started doing my master's research in 2008, I realized that in order to save chimps, I had to forget about chimps and focus on humans. And that's hard for me because I like chimps a lot better than I like most humans. So my research showed that the best way to conserve chimps in two African countries, Uganda and Cameroon, was to improve the quality of people's lives in those areas. I looked at quality of life by looking at something called human capital or human development index. And this was things like access to food and clean water, access to education and good jobs, and access to medical care. So the more access you have to these things, the better quality of life you have. My result was that as quality of life increased, so did chimpanzee population densities. So if you make people healthier, if you give them better life, lives, they're able to then help conserve their environment and they have more of a long-term investment. They're not saying, well, I don't know what I'm going to feed my child tomorrow, so if this animal comes along, I'm going to kill it because I have to at least keep my child alive for tomorrow. Instead, if you say, you are not going to go hungry. You have money. You have medical care. You're going to live to be in your 60s or 70s. Now people want to preserve their environment because they have a long-term view of conservation in their environment. So this graph shows what I just talked about. We have a positive correlation going from bottom left diagonally up to the top right. As the human development increases, the chimpanzee density also increases. This is a positive correlation. The outlier up there at the top left is Kibali. That's Jane Goodall's research site, and it shows there are pretty much no humans there, um, and there's a lot of chimps. And so um, if you take humans out of the equation, of course, chimpanzee density is kind of skyrocket. All right, so how do you improve human quality of life? Well, for my doctorate research, I decided to focus on a huge health problem, which is clean water. About 1 billion people around the world do not currently have access to safe drinking water. We know water is necessary for life, and one out of every seven people has water that will probably make them sick or kill them. These are the sources where people are getting their water in a lot of African and Asian communities. It is dirty, it is muddy, it has people in it, it has pathogens, parasites, diseases, but they don't have any other way to get the water. Another problem is people don't realize that water has invisible microbes in it that is making them sick. So they kind of are stuck with a resource and then they don't even understand the health reasons for why they or their children are sick and how standing in the river, washing their hands in the river, going to the bathroom by the river is contaminating that water source. So I decided to focus on clean water because waterborne illnesses are 90% of childhood mortality. So that means 90% of children under the age of five in these countries are dying because of unclean water. The second major killer of children is respiratory illness. And this is because people have been told to make their water clean, they have to boil it. So they're cutting down more trees and they're boiling the water all day long, which creates a lot of smoke and a lot of breathing problems for children. So this is what every day looks like in the village. This is not a good environment to have your children living in. So now by trying to stop the number one killer of children, you're causing the number two killer in children. The people who suffer most from this are adult women and elderly um, because they're the ones in charge of taking care of the children. The women and the elderly have to go out and get the firewood. They have to come back and they have to burn the fires all day. They have to then also make food, clean things, watch their children. It's exhausting. It doesn't give them any chance to go to school, to work, to earn extra money. They're really just tied to doing this manual labor and still getting their children sick. So imagine waking up every morning having to hike miles, to chop down a tree, to carry this back on your head, to then burn fires all day long, along with all the other chores you have to do. 
So in order to be effective, you have to use a biocultural approach. I'm merging science with culture. I worked with a, an organization called Life Water for my dissertation, and I helped start an organization called Bright Water. And these both merge scientific approaches and spiritual and cultural approaches in order to get people to take control of their health and get clean water. So for my dissertation, for my PhD, I interviewed people all over the world in Africa and in Asia. And I interviewed people who are working with uh, nonprofits to help address this issue of unclean water. And I wanted to see what actually motivates people to learn about unclean water and to change behaviors to make sure that they are getting clean water and helping the health of everybody around them. And I found that regardless of culture, there are three things that motivate people to do this. Number one, if you tell them it could save their children's lives, they're on board. Number two, if you tell them it will save them time and money, they're on board. And number three, if you show that doing this actually can help them be a spiritual person, be a, a better person morally, um, and this was with both Christianity and Islam, they took it very seriously, and regardless of culture, they would get on board with making these changes and learning about water. So my goal is always to turn research into practice. So Bright Water um, has taken um, these techniques into the field to teach people about their water. Okay? People think if their water is clear, it's clean. It's not. They don't understand about invisible microbes like bacteria, E. coli, even hepatitis. So the current methods that people use to disinfect water are boiling, which causes a lot of smoke and cuts down trees, or putting chlorine in water, which is not great to ingest every day and is very, very expensive. Okay. So these solutions are causing secondary problems. Our solution is solar pasteurization. You do not need to heat water to boiling, which is 212, in order to kill microbes. You only boil it because that way you know that it's hot enough. It's a visual. You only have to heat water to 149 to kill all of the bad things in the water. We're going to use sun. These people live by the equator. They have 12 hours of sun every day. It's direct resource. It's free. It's easy. They don't have to cut down trees and they don't have to tend fires all day, they don't produce smoke, and it frees up a lot of time and money for them. So if you heat water to 149 degrees, it will kill all parasitic worms, it will kill all bacteria and viruses like E. coli, cholera, and polio, and it will even kill hepatitis A, which is the hardest thing to get out of water. So here is a, social, uh, a solar excuse me, pasteurization unit. It's just basically foil and cardboard, and it's in the sun, and you put a metal pot of your water sitting directly in the sun, and the reflection will heat it up to 149 degrees. How do we know when it's been 149 degrees? We use something called a WAPI, a water pasteurization indicator. It's a tube of wax that happens to melt at exactly 149 degrees. So you put this in your water, and when you see all of the, max has, the wax has melted and fallen down, that water is pasteurized, you can take the WAPI out, let it cool, and you can use it again. You can make a lot of supply of water, you can have the whole village pitch in, you can store gallons and gallons of clean water so that you have a resource that's easy to access. And of course, you take away all of that labor. You give people time and um, resources and money that they can spend in other ways because they're not tending to these fires. It's also really good for the elderly because physically they might be unable to boil water. So now all they have to do is put a WAPI in it. It's very, very easy. We also want to teach people about water. So we have portable water testing kits. We don't have to go to the city. We don't have to send this off to a research site. We don't have to pay money for it. Instead, you have a personalized kit for each village. What we do is we contact somebody in that village. We bring them over here or we meet them over in their village. We train them. And then they take all of their knowledge and resources back to their community to teach their own village members. And this is important because 
You don't want to have white Westerners coming into a culture saying, you're doing things wrong. You need to do it the way I tell you. We don't have a good reputation in Africa. People do not trust Westerners. They do not trust white people. So instead, you empower one person and you give that person the resources and the knowledge they need to go and teach all of their family, all of their villagers. So you have people learning about pathogens. They bring in water. They put it on a little film that's a Petri dish. They put it in a baggie. They tuck it in their waistband and it sits against their body and it heats with our body temperature for 12 hours. And if it comes up with blue dots, that's the invisible E. coli. They can now see that stuff is actually in the water. Then they take the same water, they do a solar pasteurization outside until the WAPI melts, they test it again and all of the blue is gone. So they have actual evidence they can see that there was something bad in the water and now that water is clean. One thing you can also do is go on Facebook and look at FOTO, which is Friends of the Old. This is a related project that we're doing to target the elderly people taking care of orphan grandchildren. And now that they are able to pasteurize their water, they have time to do small um, projects to earn money for their village and to earn money to send their children to school and their grandchildren to school. So if you go on Facebook, you can find photo, F-O-T-O, and you can like that. Um, you can also find um, Bright Water and you can find Life Water um, online and you can um, uh, spread the word about that, help with fundraising, etc. But the main point here is educating people to take control of their own health teaching that one person, right? And that person goes back and teaches a whole community and it's the ripple effect and people will then spread knowledge to take control of their health, to save their children's lives and to help conserve their environment and therefore help chimpanzees. So here are some ways you can help. Remember, the biggest hurdle is ignorance. So please tell people, use social media, do a project on it, tell your friends and family. Also be an informed consumer. If you're buying a wooden product, make sure it's sustainable. It's from a forest that's not causing deforestation. Don't buy anything with a smiling chimp. Tell people not to buy anything with a smiling chimp. Write to companies who are advertising with that or having them in, in the uh, movies and TV. Tell them you will not be a consumer of that product. Um, also, be aware of palm oil. You have a handout on that and an extra credit assignment on that. Um, buy products that aren't tested on animals. Don't see circuses or anything that exploits exotic animals, but do support movies that have a positive message like Disney's Chimpanzee or Monkey Kingdom where proceeds go to conservation. Support things that use CGI instead of live animals. We also have some local things you can do. The LA Zoo does a lot of conservation. I'm a docent there. I'd be happy to take you on a tour. The Gibbon Conservation Center, of course, in Santa Clarita is right here. It's a great resource. Um, you can go on Saturdays and Sundays and see Gibbons. And the Santa Ana Zoo is also really, really good for conservation. Um, social media, writing to companies, emailing, telling people about this. This is how we can get things changed. Last year, Kellogg's had no sustainable palm oil. After our campaign of one year, they now have 90% sustainable palm oil. So we can make a difference. The Brightwater Foundation can be found at brightwaterfoundation.org. Uh, the Life Water Foundation can be found online and photo, F-O-T-O, Friends of the Old on Facebook. Please promote these organizations. Please help with fundraising. This is how we really go out and try to save not only people's lives, but save the lives of the environment and nature around them too. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys when I get back.